back to another edition of the Minnesota Catholic Conference Staff Capital Update. I'm Jason Atkins. And I'm Maggie Hangy. And we're glad to be with you to share another week of what's going on at the Capitol. So much going on this legislative session, we're having a hard time keeping up, but there's a lot of really good work and ways in which we're advocating to protect human dignity and the common good. You heard about a bill a couple weeks ago involving the sale of human bones and human remains and why we're concerned about that. Now we're talking about human composting. Yeah, so a lot of you are probably familiar with composting. Maybe you compost food scraps in your kitchen or things like that. Now we're talking about composting the human body. Um, so this is not something that we agree with. We submitted testimony and testimony in opposition. You can find that on our website. But essentially what it would do is the human body is placed in a bag or a steel box and stored for months in a large facility where it's broken down and then um, any remains that aren't broken down, they're grinded and then the body, um, all these remains are scattered in the dirt So, and used essentially as fertilizer. So of course, from the standpoint of human dignity, this is not something that we agree with. The body should um, remain whole even after death and not be equated to the fertilizer in our um, ground. What if our kids are playing in the dirt and that dirt has human remains in it, our vegetables could be grown in it. So um, something that we have been watching in past years and will continue to watch this session. So distinguishing from cremation in the sense that cremation, you keep the remains in an urn or some place or you can even put them in a cemetery. But this is just taking the human body grinding it up into fertilizer and then spreading it around. Now this is different than green burial, which should right. be emphasized. And in fact, um, human composting is less green because of the process than green burial, which is, you know, often involves simply putting someone in, a, in a, either directly in the ground or in a wood biodegradable sort of casket or something like that. So human composting, though sounding green, really isn't, but just further underscores these assaults and attacks on human dignity that don't see the body and the person as something fundamentally with, with dignity, but something that can be simply ground up and tossed away and used as fertilizer. Now, our concern, of course, is that when we treat the body or the person with disrespect, living or dead, it's gonna treat, it's gonna lead to more disrespect right. of the human person as well. So this might not seem like a big deal, but this has to be brought out and drawn attention to that this is not just simply some clean choice that you can make, but we'll all often have the ways in which we approach the human person and, and why we need to stand up against it because it's gonna to lead to greater degradations of human dignity down the road. Exactly, this theme of human dignity is something we've been talking about a lot during session. It plays right into physicians assisted suicide, which is another issue that we've worked on. Continues to get, this, the bill continues to get hearings. Unfortunately, we've had a great group of testifiers every step of the way. Um, identifying problems with that legislation. Unfortunately, like a lot of legislation, um, oftentimes it doesn't get the uh, hearing and consideration it deserves. When bills come up in hearing these days, it's less of a deliberative process and more of something, well, we're gonna give it the veneer of process because we've decided it should already move forward. So um, you can be sure that when a bill gets a hearing, there is momentum behind it. And that's a real challenge, and the, the assisted suicide bill is going to get heard in the House Commerce now next week, uh, particularly on the insurance-related provisions of that, which are causing some people concern. But the bottom line on the assisted suicide legislation is speak up, speak actively, and, and connect with your legislators. Get five people in your district, invite your legislator for a one-on-one -on -one meeting. The form emails that you can do through the Catholic Advocacy Network um, and, and then catholic.org are fantastic. Even better, write a handwritten letter, tell your story, connect with your legislator, because that that issue is right at the top of our uh, concerns and it's going to undermine health care, protecting the choices of the view is going to endanger the health care choices of the rest of us and we just need to be at the forefront as a Catholic community of speaking out against that great assault on human dignity. Right, and we're so grateful. Many Catholics have already sent um, letters, as Jason mentioned. We've had over 2,000 messages sent to legislators on this issue um, just from our network. That doesn't include any of the partners or um, other people that we're working with. So we encourage you to continue um, speaking with your legislators, taking action. Many of you have even reached out to us to find out what you can uh, do a step further. And as Jason said, um, call your legislators, tell your friends. If it hasn't been brought up at the um, pulpit or in your bulletin, you can encourage your priest. We have lots of resources online, mncatholic.org slash PAS, where we have a full toolkit that you can bring this up right in your parish. For sure. 
People have a right to receive and refuse care. Our position is not that we have to extend life unnecessarily or right. prolong anyone's suffering, but we do have ways of both managing pain at the end of life through palliative care and things like advanced care directives and healthcare agents that allow you to make sure that your choices um, are being uh, honored in the care context. So there's a way to offer truly compassionate care at the end of life and assisted suicide is really not that. Exactly. Oh, another issue that we should turn to is the ongoing discussion around sports betting, uh, turning everyone's phone into an online casino or sports book. Uh, we have grave concerns about how addictive that will be. There was an important hearing in Senate taxes this week that highlighted the fact that the state will receive very little in the way of revenue from uh, gambling, sports betting, but at the same time will embrace a lot of the costs from addiction that go along with that. So there were a number of amendments uh, by legislators uh, to both expand the uh, tax base that we get from sports betting through our competitive bidding process um, and make sure that the state's getting the resources it needs uh, to combat this problem. Better would be to not have sports betting at all, but at least if we're going to have it, let's have good amendments. So our testimony and our work with legislators has really focused on highlighting those things that should be in a sports betting bill um, if it were to pass. Uh, things like what we have been able to achieve, which is the ban on in-game betting, which the author, uh, Senator Matt Klein, graciously accepted into the bill and then realized this will actually have a, an important impact on preventing fraud and abuse in-game by athletes, throwing contests and, and, and those kinds of cheating things like that as well. So it's going to also protect the integrity of uh, professional and college sports as well. So the big thing that we're watching, talking to legislators about, um, we hope the bill doesn't pass, but if it does, given the amount of money at stake uh, among so many, and this is a very lucrative industry and people want the take, if you will, um, we are trying to make sure that there are, the harms are mitigated and that legislators know about those and can see through some of the bigger stakeholder issues and get right to the heart of challenging the problem of gambling. Right, and this is like many of the issues that we work on, we're working um, with other partners as well, so working with the Joint Religious Legislative Coalition, and so it's not just the Minnesota Catholic Conference opposing this. Um, there's many other groups out in the mix trying to speak with legislators and um, share the harms of this legislation. For sure, there are uh, organizations that study problem gambling, faith community, uh, Joint Religious Legislative Coalition, as Maggie noted, that's our interfaith coalition and anti-poverty advocacy. And from their perspective, they're concerned about fragmenting families, deeper poverty that is caused by gambling addiction. Um, you know, it's, it's for people who think, oh, this is just harmless fun. Those are the folks who can absorb their losses and who have the financial means to do so. That's not most people. And that's why this could lead to really terrible economic consequences for families and communities. Exactly. So it's been, a, as you can see, a very busy week again at the Capitol. Next week, we're coming up on legislative deadlines. So they combined first and second deadline, which means any bills that want to stay alive going forward through session need to be need to be heard in all their um, committee stops. So a bill generally gets heard in, most bills get heard in multiple committees throughout session. So it needs to have hit all its committee stops by next Friday, March 22nd, I think. Correct. Policy bills. So policy, policy bills right. need to meet the deadline. Fiscal bills still have a couple more weeks. Exactly. So next week, it could be a very busy week as legislators are working to try to get all their last minute bills um, heard in committees, we're seeing some pretty long lists. So there's going to be a lot happening. One thing we've already seen is the Uniform Parentage Act come up that has um, serious implications when it comes to surrogacy, fertility services, and um, the adoption code, really. So we'll be talking a lot about that. It's going to be a really interesting hearing because it's 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 stuck in a hearing with 17 other bills. Right. And what it does is really it's a revolution in family law and what family law is. So you can bet that we'll be giving you an update on that one in the incoming editions of this program. Exactly. And there's probably other bills that are going to pop up for hearings as well. So we'll be monitoring, monitoring those as the Minnesota Catholic Conference staff. Um, and our, we have all this information on our website. We have a bill tracker up that you can see what we have taken positions on. Um, both supporting and opposing bills, and you can take action at our um, through our Catholic Advocacy Network, and there's a take action button right at the top of the homepage of our website. And Chris, our communications manager, does a great job of putting some of these links right on the screen. So 
Uh, again, always one-stop shopping. Go to our website, mncatholic.org. Thanks for watching this program. Feel free to share it with your friends. And uh, especially, it's just form relationships with your elected officials and let them know what you're thinking. Everyone has a constitutional right to be a lobbyist, to petition their government for a redress of grievances. You, as a faithful citizen, can be a lobbyist just like us and share your concerns. The work of faithful citizenship is not just voting. It happens three, the other 364 days a year as well. So, again, thanks for watching the program, and we'll look forward to seeing you again next week. Thank you.